Hello. In this video and the next, we're going to introduce the ideas of limit and a continuous function in the context of complex functions. Now last week we introduced uh, uh, complex functions, at least what a complex function was, and we started talking about linear functions, power and root functions, and we listed a bunch of uh, types of complex functions we'll see throughout the semester. We said that for all of these, we will be interested in talking about their domains and ranges, which we started talking about last week. Uh, we'll introduce inverse functions for many of these, and we'll talk about the behavior of all of these. Now, when we talk about the behavior, what exactly do we mean? Well, we mean behavior in the sense that uh, you saw it used when we're talking about functions of a real variable in calculus. We're going to be talking about limits, we're going to be talking about uh, derivatives, we're going to be talking about continuity, and uh, to get started with all of these we need to, to introduce the idea of a limit, which is what we'll do in this video. We will say that a function f has a limit of l as z approaches z0 if for every epsilon greater than zero, for every real positive number, there exists a positive real number delta such that the distance from f of z to l is less than epsilon whenever the distance from z and z naught is greater than zero but less than delta. Now informally, the limit means the same thing it did in first semester calculus. We're going to say that f of z approaches l as z approaches z naught. So in other words, as you plug in numbers that are closer and closer to z naught into your function, the function values, the images, should get closer and closer to l. But as, we, uh, as you may have seen in your first semester calculus class, um, this idea of closer and closer to is, is hard to state formally in mathematics. And this is the best way of, of doing it. So we're going to try and uh, give some visual intuition to this uh, statement here. You are expected to remember this. This is important as the formal definition of a limit. All right, to, we're going to illustrate with an example. Let's say that our function f of z is equal to z squared, the point that z is approaching in the z-plane is 1 plus i, a little speck right about here, and we claim that the limit of the function is 2i, this little speck on the imaginary axis of the w-plane. Now, if I take any, uh, any neighborhood about 1 plus i, if I take a, a ball centered at 1 plus i, and I take these points in that neighborhood and I feed them into the function z squared, they're going to get mapped to points in this region in the w plane. You'll notice that the function kind of deforms the circle into a, an interestingly shaped region. But really we're saying this limit should be 2i, which means that if I really want to prove that we do approach the point 2i, I ought to be able to specify a certain range, say the range of 4. And I'll say that if I really am approaching 2i, eventually I should be inside this bound. Now, that means that I should be able to take some neighborhood of the point 1 plus i that is small enough so that when I take that neighborhood and I feed it into the function, the images should lie inside this red circle. Now, what, how small should that ball be? Well, if we take a ball with radius 1 centered at uh, 1 plus i, and I feed all of these values into the function, their images all do happen to work. Uh, they, they lie inside this ball, epsilon equals 4. So for my value epsilon of 4, the value delta of 1 works. If my points are within 1 of 1 plus i, then the uh, function values will all be within 4 of 2i. Okay. Now, if I take a smaller epsilon, so epsilon equals 4 was rather generous, what if we made epsilon equal to 2? Is there a, a value for delta which is small enough to guarantee that the function values will lie inside this circle? And there is. If we take epsilon, or delta equal to 1 half, these values will all have function values that lie inside this epsilon ball. Well, what if I take epsilon equal to just 1? Well, I can still meet that requirement if I set delta equal to uh, one-fourth, okay? Now you get the idea that, yeah, the smaller you make your ball, the smaller you set epsilon to be, um, you're still going to be okay. 
uh, you're going to be able to find a delta that is also getting smaller and smaller. But you, no matter how tight you want the circle to uh, cling to the point 2i, there will be a value of delta that will make that happen. Now actually proving that is, is a bit uh, more technical than we're going to get into right now. Your book has a number of examples showing that a limit is the value that we say it is, and I encourage you to look at those. Um, I will say, however, that uh, beyond knowing the formal definition, um, we're not going to be so interested in, uh, in doing endless uh, definition, eh, definition problems using delta epsilon definitions to prove that a limit is a certain value. Um, we're not going to do this so much in this class because if you take a class in real analysis, you will be doing a lot of delta epsilon proofs. And at this stage, we have more interesting things to think about. All right. Please do know this formal definition, though. Now, one thing that's interesting is that in complex analysis, um, we have something that is at once the same and also kind of different than we ran into with real analysis. Okay, in real analysis, you had this idea that in order for a function to have a limit at a point x0, the value of the function needed to be the same as you approached x0 from either the left or the right. And if it was the case that the limit from the right and the limit from the left did not both equal the same number, then you could say that the limit as a whole does not exist. Now this will be the same in complex analysis. However, as z approaches z0, we need this function to be the same. And z can approach z0 from many, many different directions. Okay, And because of this fact that z can approach z0 from different directions, we'll see that the limit of z squared does exist and equals 0, while the limit of this function does not exist as uh, z approaches z not, as z, uh, approaches 0, excuse me. All right, let's, uh, let's take a look at this in terms of pictures. First, we're going to show that the limit, we're going to see that the limit as z approaches 0 of z squared equals z naught. So here is our, our function f of z equals z naught. We've got the z plane. And I have a, a couple points here in blue and in red. Now on the right, I have the w plane where I'm illustrating f of z for the blue and for the red. Now we claim that the limit of z squared as z approaches 0 is equal to 0. So we're claiming that as our image, as our points in the z plane get closer and closer to the origin, the points in the image should correspondingly get closer and closer to the origin. Now, that should happen no matter which direction I approach from. So if I take a point on the positive, or sorry, on the, uh, the imaginary axis with positive imaginary parts, and I start moving that point closer and closer down to the origin, you can see in the W plane on the right that the images are moving closer and closer and closer to zero. Okay. Similarly, if I uh, started from below, and um, started moving up, you can see that the images are again in the W plane moving closer and closer and closer to the origin. Okay. Now on the other hand, if I take the, uh, a point on the positive real axis and move it closer to the, the origin in the Z plane, you'll see that the images also approach the, uh, the origin as well from a different direction than the blue points did. And it'll be the same no matter whether I start um, from the left or from the right. The red image point also always approaches the origin. Since you seem to be approaching the origin no matter which direction you move in, and this will be true not only in these vertical and horizontal directions, but as you approach on diagonals, as you approach in a spirally manner, you'll see that the function values always approach the same value of uh, 0. And that is, in fact, the limit as z approaches 0. Now, on the other hand, we said that this function here does not have a, a limit. Uh, the limit does not exist. Now, to illustrate that, let's take a look at, a, at the same kind of setup. I've got the function here. x and y are the real parts of the variable z. And I'm going to take these, uh, this function and evaluate it at points that approach the origin um, from both from two different directions, along the imaginary axis and along the real axis. Now, as I uh, plug in points in along the real axis, my x will be um, 
a real number, my y will be 0. And as I uh, plug x and, and 0 in uh, for x and y, you'll see that in every case, the imaginary part of the, of the result will be 2i. And as z approaches the origin on the left-hand side, you'll see on the right-hand side that the images approach the value that appears to be about 2i. Um, of course, the function itself is actually undefined when you plug 0 in, but it looks for all the world like we are approaching the value of 2i. Okay. Now, let's say, on the other hand, that I'm approaching the origin, same point, approaching the origin, but this time I'm doing it along the imaginary axis. Now, as I approach the origin from above, you'll see that the images on the right seem to be approaching a point right there, a point, a real point, about negative 1. Now again, the function is undefined when I actually plug in 0, but the closer I get to 0 along this vertical line, in the vertical direction, the closer my function gets to negative 1. Now, as I approach from a horizontal direction, my function gets closer and closer to 2i. As I approach in a, neg in a vertical direction, my function gets closer and closer to negative 1. Because I'm not approaching the same value with the images, uh, because I'm getting different values that I'm approaching, as my uh, z's approach the same point from different directions, we would say that this function does not have a, a limit. The limit does not exist as z approaches 0. All right. So hopefully you get the idea that complex functions can be kind of interestingly behaved. Um, it's, uh, it's very easy for a function to, to not have a limit. A lot easier um, with, with somewhat nicer looking functions than, than you would expect uh, from, from your experience in calculus. Now, one tool that will be useful for us, if you need to see if a function exists, uh, if the limit exists at a certain point, or if the function has a limit equal to L, you can just take a look at the real and imaginary parts of the functions and use those to decide. So let's suppose that um, you're taking the function f, which has real part u and imaginary part v, and you're approaching z0, and the, uh, the real and imaginary part of z0 are x0 and y0. Then to see um, if the limit is l, all you really need to do is take the limit of the real part and see if it's equal to the real part of l, Take the limit of the imaginary part and see if that's equal to the imaginary part of L. Basically, this uh, fact allows us to take a problem in complex analysis, complex limits, and turn it into a problem for multivariable calculus. We're just testing the, uh, whether the limit as you approach um, this point in the image of two real variables is a certain value or not. All right, now that, um, that shows us that, in some respects, the limits of complex functions do behave like limits of real variables, functions of real variables. And, um, and a lot of these rules uh, will be very, very familiar to you. Basically, you can take a constant and, uh, and factor it out of a limit. Um, the difference here is that the constant could be a complex number, not just a real number anymore. The limit of a sum of two complex functions is equal to the sum of the limits, provided that those limits individually exist. The limit of a product is equal to the product of the limits, and the limit of the quotient equals the quotient of the limits, provided that the uh, limit of the function in the denominator is, is not equal to zero. All right. Now, in the next video, we're going to talk about how we use this definition of limit, uh, what it's good for. See you there.